Okay, so what's going on, guys? Uh, welcome to the fourth and final part of the Xilinx FPGA projects using Vivado um, button detect or button slash keypad detect uh, one. This is going to be talking about how to generate the bitstream, going over constraints, and then finally showing you how it looks down on the FPGA board. So let's get right in. Um, we're going to go up, and what we need to do to the sources box. We're going to go up to the sources box and we need to add some constraints. And there's going to be two types of constraints that we're going to add. So we're going to add timing constraints, which are going to tell the tools and designs what, what our clock speed is. And if we have any other timing constraints like input delays or output delays, which, which we don't, but um, just if you did. And then IO constraints, which are going to tell the... Um, it's going to tell the tools which uh, input and output pins we are using in our design. So we're going to go to add or create constraints. Okay, and um, for me, this is going to be different for some of you, um, but it might be the same. If you're using the RDZ710 board from Digilent, you can use this file. So we're going to go to add files and look in constraints, and we're going to, look, going to add the IO file. And we're going to add the timing, control click, click OK, click finish. OK, now we expand the constraints up here in the sources box and we double click to view it in the text editor. We'll double click on IO and double click on timing. So the timing is, here's what we're going to do. This is my clock, so mine's 125 megahertz, right? So it has a period of 8.00 nanoseconds. Um, zero four that is the 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 duty cycle so 50 percent right so for four counts it's low for four counts it's high um, that's gonna be the clock and that's all that we're gonna have actually in our timing constraints sometimes you can have input delays and output delays and um, other things just to do other stuff but we don't need those in in this um, and to be honest I'm not great at uh, timing analysis so if if adding more timing constraints in a project like this would be beneficial then put it in the comments I'd love to know about it because I I need to get better at that um, so that's gonna be it you can add your clock so you can just copy and paste this make sure you change your period in nanoseconds and then your your duty cycle if it's if it's not 50 I think most I think the clocks are 50 percent but but uh, yeah just change it around make sure you fit and then you can you can add that into your timing XDC file and in the IO XDC file this is where we're going to define all of our IO constraints okay so this is how we do that we do it with a set property dict package pin h16 IO standard LVC MOS 30, 33, which means 3.3 volt logic, get ports clock. And that should tie in to, if we go to our sources tab, that's going to tie in to the ports that we have in our, oops, in our top module, which is our button detect module. So see, we have our clock here, which is 125 megahertz. So we're tying that to package pin H16. And well, how do you get these? Well, for for my board, what you can have what you can have is called a master XDC file. And if you Google, so let's go to my board, RDZ710 Master XDC. And so you can click on this. There's a GitHub link to it. And this has all the locations of all the peripherals and everything that's on the board. So you can see here's our LEDs. Here's what pins those are attached to on the FPGA, right? Here is our RGB LEDs. And L15 is attached to LED4 blue. Here's uh, some switches um, down. Here's some HDMI stuff. Here's some HDMI transmit. Um, here's just the basic I/O. So you can you can copy and paste this into your I/O constraints file, and then you can comment and uncomment the lines that are you're using slash not using by using the hash. So hash comments. It's not if there's not a hash mark, or then you don't comment it. So. That is how I did that. Uh, I had switch one is going to be attached to the clear. Um, 
I used an RGB LED to create the blue and red LED signals. I used all the buttons like I would say, so button 3 is map, match, uh, mapped to button 3, button 2 to button 2, button 1 to button 1, and button 0, which is right here, is mapped to enter. Right, So we can see here, button 0 is mapped to enter, which is what we said in our test bench file. And yeah, I think that's it. Oh, and then we need one output for the speaker, right? So one goes to ground and one is the output for the speaker. So I used the CKIO um, chip kit in outer, the CK stands for chip kit outer digital header. So mine has like a sort of Arduino looking, um, well, I think it's actually Arduino compatible looking headers and I'll show you on the video of the board. But so I use pin zero, IO zero on for the tab with the tone out. So yeah, so let's go ahead and save that. And if you remember, um, if we looked at our button detect, what we did in the simulation, and this, this is definitely not ideal, but it just, like I said, I was being impatient. So I made the simulation take uh, faster than it normally would because I simulated with values that were not realistic for, for real time. So I simulated with a button press of 2.5 milliseconds, uh, which is a very short button press. And then we had to um, edit these couple values within the actual code. And it said, make sure to change back before generating your bitstream, right? So what we want to do is we want to have these actually work and actually stay lit for one second. And so if you remember, we reduced them by a factor of 100 before simulation. So now we need to increase them by a factor of 100 again. So I just added two zeros to these and to both lines um, 137 and 152. Then I'm going to add, go down, da, 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 and I'm going to add two nines to this always block. Um, it's going to be on line, it starts on line 194, and then the two, line, two nines that we're adding are on line 198. And then the next always block below that, it's going to start on line 217. We're going to add two nines to that as well because we reduced that by a factor of 100. So now that is up to 125 million, right? One, two, three, one, two, three. Yes, that is correct. Okay, and now we can go ahead and save that. What we're going to want to do now is generate the bitstream. So you can go up here to this little arrow with some zeros and ones on it. You can click that, and mine says synthesis is out of date because I already tried to do it. Yours will probably not say that, um, if unless you tried to do it. But I'm going to click yes to start again. And it's just going to reset my runs. Yours won't have to reset. Um, yours, I think yours will just pop up with this, actually. And you're going to click OK. Mine says number of jobs 2 because that's how many cores I have on my CPU. Yours might say 4 or 1 or I don't know. I have not seen one with 3, but maybe it, there is one. So... There we go. Launch runs on localhost. Yes, that's fine. And click OK. Now we're going to wait a little while and it's going to go through. We're going to minimize that and we can keep track of what's happening using this design runs tab down here in this lower uh, window. We can also keep track of the warning messages and error messages down here. So this is default IP output path. We're getting one warning already, could not find the directory, and I don't think that's important because we are not using any IP in here. Um, and I think the IP output path is, I think that's for IP user generated IP cores maybe because I, I was doing that earlier. So I might've put that in my settings. So I think it's fair that we can ignore that right now. And we will just wait till the synthesis and implementation is done running. Okay, so now that our bitstream generation has successfully completed, this window will pop up. And we'll have a couple choices of what to do. So we can open the implemented design, we can view our reports, we can open our hardware manager, which is where we're going to um, program the FPGA or configure the FPGA, or we can generate a memory, memory configuration file. And what I would like to do is show you the, show you the implemented design. So I'm going to click on OK. And while that's opening up, if you look down below at this design runs tab, you can see kind of the resources that we use. So we use 66 lookup tables and 101 flip flops. 
Our total power is uh, 0 0.097 watts or 97 milliwatts. Our worst negative slack is 3.246. I think that's in nanoseconds, which is good that it's positive because it should be. If it's not, it should, it'll be red, and that means you have a timing error. And what that means is, um, I think it means that things are getting to your, you have too much logic in between your clocked elements, and so there's not enough time for the signal to propagate through to get there on the on the next rising edge of the clock cycle. So open implemented design is coming up, and uh, we got a couple warnings. And let's see what it says. An input, input delay is missing. Oh, that went away. Okay. Oh, input delays are missing and output delays are missing. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm not super good on, um, on timing. So if you could help like add these input and output delays it doesn't seem to matter too much when we get it down onto the board probably like a faster design yes it would probably matter but that it's okay for now but if you can help me on that leave it in this uh, comments box um, in our design rules check the drc says ps7 zinc requires ps7 block um, this one we can we can ignore because we're not even using the processing system so the ps ps stands for processing system so that's okay um, let's see if we got any other warnings. Looks like we're all doing okay. PS7, yeah, like I said, we can ignore that one. Okay, and then, so this is cool because this is our implemented design, and this kind of shows what, or it does show, what resources we use. So if we zoom in, we can see these are, so we have carry logic right here we have what are these guys flip-flops we have some i think these are lookup tables yeah lookup tables so all this cool stuff right here we can see what resources we used in our design um if we go over here these are some io things oh that's our clock um what are these buttons yeah input buffers So that's pretty, what is this guy? IO bank clock region? Yeah. I don't know. I just like to look through this and see see what happens. So let's go down and let's go to all the way down. Program and debug, and below that is going to be open hardware manager. At this point, you're going to want to plug your FPGA into your computer. So I'm going to do that right now. Boom. Nice and easy. And you can see no hardware target is open. So we're going to open our target. And I'm going to click auto connect. Wait for it to find my board. We have Vivado to find my board. And now that it found it, we can go ahead and program the device. Um, if it doesn't have the bitstream already loaded in, you can find it. So that's going to be in YouTube Detect Runs. So if we go here, this is going to be the main project file. It's going to be under Runs, and it's going to be under Implementation 1. And there's the bitstream, so we can select that. If it's not selected already for you, I think it automatically selects it. But if it doesn't, for some weird reason, I've never had it not, that's how you find it. And we can click program and it's going to program the device. Okay, so we're looking down at the configured FPGA. You can see it has the green done light. Um, there's the zinc chip that's on there. And we're just using, like I said, the programmable logic. I have switch one. Once again, it's mapped to the clear input and it's active low. So active low, it's, it's in clear and active one. Now everything's enabled. Button three maps to button three, button two maps to button two, button one maps to button one, button zero 
maps to enter and uh, we're talking about the um, in respect to the ports of the UUT and then if I press this enter button right now beep then we get that little red LED and that tone was me not the tone generator this is the little buzzer that I'm going to be using um, so if we put one pin to sorry about my creaky chair one pin is going to IO0, which we put in the constraints file. And the other pin is going to go to ground, which is right there. Make sure it's in ground and not, not power. So yeah, so there's our little speaker. So if we press the enter, you get the little error tone. Okay, so let's go through and see what happens when we enter an incorrect sequence. So we, let's go two, three, one, one. Okay, and let's try entering that. Oh, it's wrong. Well, that makes sense because our correct sequence is two, three, one, three. So let's try entering two, three, one, three. So two, three, one, three. Press the enter. Boop. It totally works, that, you know, pretty, pretty cool actually. And uh, let's say this, we found a bug in simulation and let's try it out here. Um, let's say we are entering the wrong sequence and we realize it. So let's say we hit two, three, and we accidentally hit the three and we're like, oh no, what's gonna happen? Well, let's pull the clear low and put it back high again. Now it should be in reset. And now we can enter our correct sequence. Two, three, one, three. And it works. So I think the bug um, somehow, it's something in my test bench file. Um, I'm sorry it didn't work out in simulation. It works fine on the board. I think we actually didn't pull the pull the switch back up high and that's probably what, that's probably, that might be one of the things that's, that's causing it. In the, in the test bench file, we didn't, we didn't do that. Um, one of the things that I forgot to mention is in the XDC file for the pin constraints, you have to search for that on your own for your own board. So if you have a different FPGA board from this one, you're going to have to search online to find your your master XDC file. And if there's not one, you can get it off of a data sheet or something like that. So once again, it's pretty cool. So two, three, one, three, enter totally works and wrong one we'll just go two one 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 i pressed the one three times in case you didn't see enter ah it's so awesome okay thank you so much for watching i really hope that you enjoyed this and that you learned something from it um if you have any comments comment down below i'd love to hear what you think and uh if i have if you have any feedback for me um i know i need a mic and i'm working on getting one of those <laughs> so you can comment that if you want, I guess, but I already know that I need it. But thank you so much for watching and have a great weekend or week, whatever you're in right now. Bye. One last thing that I forgot to mention is I didn't use any debouncing on the uh, on the switches or the buttons. And that is uh, really important for all switches, actually. And the reason I didn't use it is just for simplicity. And the fact that the, the switches on my, or the buttons and switches on my board seem to be pretty, you know, they're pretty new, so that they seem to be working great. Um, I have been, with, the, with testing this, I haven't had any issues. But if you're dealing with older switches or just any switches in general, you, it's really, it's a really good idea to debounce them. And Nanland, he's a, an awesome FPGA guy on YouTube. He has a tutorial about how to do this. So this is his page and I'll link this in the description as well as he has a YouTube video on it. Not that there debounce the switch right there. Okay. And so I'd recommend giving that a watch if you really want to get the, the best performance out of a project like this. So thanks.